Hello there, Internet. Vinny D here once again. And I'm coming to you with another what if. Today, I'm gonna ask a wild one. What if, instead of Kakarot, mm. Baby Kal El lands on the Dragon Ball Earth? In this weird timeline, there is no planet Vegeta. There is only Krypton. A planet of advanced technology and powerful fighters, given a wide berth by the Frieza Empire. But, coming to fear the legend of the Superman, the planet is destroyed by Frieza himself, leaving a lone space pod, carrying its last son. Isolated in the mountains, a star falls to Earth. An old man named Gohan finds inside a sleeping child and takes him in. What he finds is not the wild, untamed boy with a tail, but a gentle-hearted, yet unusually strong baby boy. And so begins the story of Dragon Ball, but a very different Dragon Ball than the one we remember. So how would things change? Of course, Kal-El has no Ozaru transformation. So the most important thing in his early life is that Grandpa Gohan does not die. This means he has more training, more upbringing. And this is quite important to his character. While in the DC Universe, Middle American Christian values informed Superman's values, Goku has more Buddhist values, but they're not all that different. At his core, he's still taught to do good deeds, help others, and improve himself. And in the DC Universe, of course, his adventures didn't really start until his teen years. But we know, a certain blue-haired girl arrives much earlier in his life. When Bulma arrives, Goku, yes, his name is still Goku, because it would be Gohan who named him, he's fascinated by this creature he's never seen. A girl, you say? And of the mystery of that Dragon Ball he's been keeping all these years, and that there are six more? Adventure calls to him. But, since Grandpa Gohan is still alive, Goku respectfully asks permission. Gohan knows there's something special about this boy. And though he does not grant Bulma the four-star ball, he does permit Goku to lead on his adventure. And so begins Dragon Ball proper. We have a very strong little boy and a girl. However, they must leave the ball behind, for Gohan has demanded that in order to claim the four-starred ball, they must first prove their worth by gathering the other six. This will be important later. From here on, Dragon Ball is not much different. We have a very strong little boy, a girl, and a quest. Where things change, of course, is the encounter with the Ox King. More specifically, Master Roshi's involvement. This Goku is many things, but he is not quite the perfect martial arts prodigy that Kakarot would have become. This means he can't copy the Kamehameha right away. However, still, Roshi recognizes the boy who was kind to his turtle before, and upon hearing that he's the grandson of his old friend Gohan, still offers to train him. This is also the point at which Goku meets Chi-Chi. However, this Goku is a little bit smarter and knows what the word marriage means and does not accept her proposal. Things follow much the same until at the end of the saga when they are captured by the Pilaf gang. There's no full moon to bail them out this time, but, Pilaf now does not have all seven Dragon Balls. Stealing the Dragon Radar, 
Pilaf heads off to the location of the Four Star Ball. And the gang are trapped until sunrise. Up until now, Goku doesn't realize the source of his strength. But he always feels weaker at night. In fact, even remembers. Wasn't it nighttime when he lost his first fight against Yamcha, but won again during the day? And when the sun rises, and he fears he and his friends are about to be baked alive, they're sweating, they're exhausted, and yet Goku is feeling stronger and stronger, but desperate to save his friends, until, in a burst of energy, red light erupts forth from his eyes, cutting them free. They're out. Has Pilaf already reached the four-star ball? It's a race against time to go back home to where it all began. But Goku is carrying his heat-stroked and exhausted friends. It's only the shapeshifters that can transform and fly ahead. And just as before, the wish is wasted on a pair of panties for Oolong. And although their end goal was lost, Goku feels as if he's grown a little from the journey. And Bulma is still fascinated by this strange boy who stopped to help others every step along the way. Even now, though he demolished Pilaf's airship, he still lets his enemies go. Goku wonders... How much can I grow? How much can I improve? He takes it upon himself to accept Roshi's offer of training and heads off. His training under Roshi is much the same, learning martial arts that supplement his powers that he already possesses. This proves valuable in compensating for his weakness at night. Again, remember, this Kal-El has started much younger than he did in DC Comics. He's not as strong, and he hasn't yet developed the ability to store his solar energy overnight. But he does learn to use Ki, now having two sources of power, and eventually gains control of the Kamehameha. His training complete, he goes to the World Martial Arts Tournament, and things go much the same. Roshi knows, though, he has to keep this young fighter hungry. He can't be led to believe he's the strongest in the world. No, there must always be someone stronger. And under the name Jackie Chun, he enters the tournament himself. Of course, there's again no Ozaru Rampage and no blowing up the moon. It's just a straight martial arts battle, especially as it goes on into the night where his solar powers can't aid him. And on a matter of better technique, Roshi still wins. The only difference here is a Kryptonian's appetite isn't quite what a Saiyan's is, so this Goku does not eat all of Roshi's winnings. When the Red Ribbon Army threatens the peace, Goku knows he has to do the right thing and fight back for the innocent. The Red Ribbon Army fares about the same as it did in Dragon Ball. The big difference is the battle with Tao. Although Tao still kills Upa's father, the result is a complete curb stomp in Goku's favor the first time. The battle taking place during the day, Goku is much, much stronger. Although Tao still throws a grenade at Goku, Goku instead wraps himself around it and allows it to harmlessly detonate against his skin. Because this Goku is less inclined to kill people. Now Goku has a goal. To revive Upa's father with the Dragon Balls. And he thinks to himself, If only I'd been a little quicker. I could have saved him. And this, rather than a crushing defeat at the hands of Tao is why he climbs Korin's tower. And although Goku is now already fast enough to catch Korin, he doesn't quite have the control to do it. And here's where we get the Superman ability to super speed 
start and stop on a dime. He completes his training under Corrin much more quickly and continues on his journey. Though again, killing fewer people. Most notably, not killing Dr. Giroux's son. This will come back to be important later. After the defeat of the Red Ribbon Army, Dr. Giroux isn't quite as furiously vengeful as he was before, but... MY CREATIONS! How could they lose to a child? I'll have my revenge next time! So now we have a more supervillain, Dr. Giroux. He sets his plans in motion, but he's still going to be a more constant annoyance to Goku, constantly sending his machines against him. And after the Red Ribbon Army saga, there's the next World Martial Arts Tournament. And it ends much the same way. Although the daytime battle makes Goku much stronger, he has not yet learned to fly. And while he gives Tien an even harder fight, especially when Tien finds his solar flare keeps making Goku stronger, flight is ultimately still too much of an advantage and Tien wins by ring out. With the close of the martial arts tournament, Goku goes to meet his old friend Krillin and finds his lifeless corpse. And so begins the King Piccolo saga. Which goes much the same. Goku is still young. Still really hasn't gathered his Superman power set yet. So, in their first encounter, Goku is completely trounced by King Piccolo. He's beaten, bloodied, barely alive. But determined to try again. The losses are the same as before, and Goku gets no say in power-ups from his defeats. He goes to find the ultra-divine water and grow stronger, and the end result, much the same. Though Goku does not want to kill King Piccolo, or normally wouldn't, he's enraged, loses control, and with his powers stronger than ever, Laser eye beam blasts a hole right through him. Not much else changes. Goku, filled with remorse at the losses, even if he could wish them back, he knows that the innocent suffered due to his own weakness. It isn't because he wants to know how strong he can become, but because he feels he must become stronger, that he goes to climb and train with Kami, the Guardian of the Earth. And so the years pass. Goku, the Superboy, now a Superman, arrives for the World Martial Arts Tournament. However, the outcome is a little different in the final round. It's broad daylight. Goku is every bit as strong as he would have become as a Saiyan, and now, amplified by his Kryptonian powers, completely crushes Piccolo in battle. And then, approaches him, and extends a hand. You fought well. You know, you don't have to be your father. Why? Why would you do this for me? Because I don't want to become like him either. Piccolo rejects Goku's mercy. Flies off and swears he'll come again another day. And that Goku had best be prepared when that day comes. During all this, Bulma has changed the way she looks at Goku. He's no longer a child. He's become a man, and he fascinates her. And Goku has come to respect Bulma and her brilliant scientific mind, and the love of, of adventure that they share. In this world, Bulma marries Goku. And so they ride off 
to have one more adventure. They return home where it all began. They couldn't help but notice, though he'd been there for the previous two tournaments, Grandpa Gohan wasn't in the stands. And they find him. Sickly. Ancient. He passes away of natural causes. Smiling. At the good man his son has become. And with his last words, tells him of the strange pod he found Goku in. When Bulma and Goku go to investigate the pod, they learn of his true origins. Bulma activates the crystals inside, finds the data recordings, and hears those profound words. They can be a great people, Kal-El. They wish to be. They need only someone to show them the way. Goku finds a new calling. He knows that his powers were meant for more than just winning tournaments. They were meant for a nobler cause, for the betterment of the world and all mankind. And so, taking the symbol of hope that he finds emblazoned across his craft, he stitches it into his gi and moves to the city with Bulma. And there, he becomes a new man. A super man. Join me next time as I explore what would happen if Kal-El landed in the world of Dragon Ball Z. Until then, thank you, good night. This is Benny D, out, be good.